Yes, so this next session is talking about reinforced concrete failure modes. Some of the objectives for this is we're going to describe the potential failure modes for different kinds of reinforced concrete structures and then explain the mechanisms that affect the failures. We're going to look at ductile structures versus brittle structures, look at um, the type of loading. Uh, another, another big thing to consider in reinforced concrete is current design codes, analyzing our old structures for current design codes and some of the some of the things you need to watch for when doing that. We'll also construct an event tree for this potential failure mode and how to estimate the event probabilities. So within our inventories, we have all types, shapes, and sizes of reinforced concrete structures. These, um, particularly on dams, you have here on the left, this is Glen Canyon Dam, and you have these massive concrete piers that are founded directly on rock. Here in the top middle, this is Canyon Ferry Dam in Montana, and you have these tall, slender piers that are on top of a multi-hundred-foot concrete dam. And um, if, in another presentation, I hope to have time to talk about this one in particular, where the reclamation went to an issue evaluation, then there was problems, went to a corrective action study to fix this, kind of like a feasibility study, and then went back to an issue evaluation to do more, more uh, sophisticated finite element modeling on this dam. And then you get some of our more massive structures, uh, like a thick buttress dam shown here. And then you also, we have a lot of, there's a lot of thin buttress dams out there that are notorious for poor performance and seismic events in the cross canyon directions. When we look at flood walls, predominantly so many of those in the Corps of Engineers, flood walls are all shapes and sizes. Um, some just retaining water when there's flood. Some of them have soil behind the behind the wall, and a barge impacts another another big thing to consider on these navigation projects. Probably one of the most infamous failures here is the the some of the eye wall failures during Hurricane Katrina back in 2005. This particular one in the lower ninth ward had a failed eye wall, and I think there's, I don't know all the details on this. A lot of you all know, would know a lot more on this. I'm sure there's entire training, training sessions and week long just on Hurricane Katrina and some of the failures there. But there was, there was an eye wall that failed that did not overtop. So again, looking at flood walls and more specifically barge impacts, it was estimated that approximately 200 barges came loose from their moorings during the during Hurricane Katrina in the greater metropolitan area of New Orleans. It wasn't actually directly attributed, any failures directly attributed to barge failures. So getting into some factors that are influencing strength and stability, again, that's Structures, we all have all types, different shapes and sizes. We have some tall, slender walls that are more likely to bend and topple and rotate as for their failure. And then you get into more of these structures that have a low height to width ratio, more stable structures by size, but these type of structures tend to slide. And then considering reinforced concrete, how much reinforcement is there? You also consider the lift lines. Are they bonded? Are they unbonded? And if you're lucky enough to have shear stirrups, good. I don't see that too often on, on a lot of a lot of reclamations, old structures. And then these walls are retaining different types of loadings. You have water loading, then you have soil loading on those. And in some later sessions, we'll get into the seismic, the seismic potential failure modes. And also the uh, the base conditions and supports for the wall are also always important, whether it's you have a pin structure or fixed. Oftentimes we have bridges spanning across our spillways, and that's always a fun discussion of what kind of support does that bridge add, and we'll talk about that a little later. So looking at spillway specific spillways here, a lot of times for these potential failure modes, we're considering the spillway where the gated structure is. And that's because there could be a path to the reservoir at that, at that location. If we're looking at the picture on the left, 
and one of those shoot walls were to fail, say during a seismic event, but we don't combine, we don't consider a flood event at the exact same time as an earthquake event. So if, you, if it failed during a seismic loading, most likely you'd be able to intervene and either construct the wall, but you may end up having to alter the operations of the reservoir, which would not, which is not, a, not an ideal situation. So a lot of times we are for potential failure modes, uncontrolled release of the reservoir, we're looking at spillway walls that are in and around the spillway gates. This next slide here kind of, it gets into dynamics 101 of talking about stiffness, frequency and period of your structure. So each structure has a definite signature dynamic characteristic. Um, some things to note, the natural frequency of the member decreases as the height to width ratio increases, and the natural frequency of the structure becomes smaller as a reinforced concrete structure is damaged due to earthquake shaking. So the stiffness of the st structure is, is changing and that changes the response of the, of the structure. And the figure, on the figure on the right, you can see just in general, the small, smaller, stouter structures tend to attract more load than tall, slender structures. And I mentioned the frequency of the structure and the period of the structure. There are simplified ways that you can calculate this that doesn't involve finite element modeling. And this is either in your packet or it's in the best chapter, best, best practice chapters. And just a simplified way to calculate, calculate the period, calculate the period of the structure or the inverse of that, which is the frequency of the structure for say mass, mass gravity structures. And then also looking at taller slender structures for a simplified way to calculate the period. Also impacting this is whether the structure is on rock or soil foundation, so that comes up often throughout these presentations of, of that matters what the, what the structure is founded on. And you also have to consider, such as I mentioned Canyon Ferry, when you have a structure on top of a, on top of a, a dam or on top of another structure that there's amplification that needs to be considered. So getting into some of the material properties. So when we're looking at the steel reinforcement, we're typically oftentimes looking at older structures, 50 plus years old, and rarely on the drawings do they have what the, what the yield strength is of the steel. If you're lucky enough to have the specs, you may be able to track down what type of steel was used. Sometimes that's not, that's not available either. So there are guidances that provide some approximate, based on the time frame of construction, what the yield strength of the rebar may be. Um, so there's a chart here that shows this, but there's also some good references, this report number 48 and ASCE 41, which is seismic rehabilitation of existing buildings. And also this FEMA 356 documents has guidance um, and also to, what to consider during a seismic load that you can actually push these yield, uh, push these yield strengths by 125% for dynamic analysis. So concrete material properties. So Cody did a great job of it going through this yesterday of how to, how to get the, the concrete properties when you, that's not always known. And oftentimes you know what the minimum, minimum compressive strength was, 3,000 PSI a lot of times on these older structures. But in reality, what it is today is likely higher than that. And he went over a lot of those, a lot of those equations to find that as well as the tensile strength, which is always very important in these uh, calculating the capacity of concrete members. So there's some other values that, that are important to get when you're analyzing these structures. Um, and again, there's other these references out here that can be used to, to estimate what your concrete strength is. Uh, I mentioned ASE 41 again there. But again, with all these structures, it's important to consider uncertainty because oftentimes we just don't know. Even if you have some cores, it was mentioned yesterday, well, what if the cores were through the facing concrete of a, of a gravity dam? It could be a lot different than the interior of the structure where the aggregate sizes are much larger. So there's always uncertainty in these values. Uh, concrete coring, Again, we talked about this, so it's, it's, it's great to have concrete coring and can do it when you, when you can. Some levels of study just doesn't allow for that. So again, reference the E1 chapter. It's a great reference for concrete material. Um, some other things to consider are construction joints. 
of whether they're bonded or unbonded. And oftentimes construction joints are where we would least like to have them as far as the structural capacity, but they are needed and for construction. And like in, in this case, in a lot of cases, the construction joints right at the top of the OG crest, right where the wall starts, but that's also where you anticipate having the highest moments. So getting the reinforcement details. This is a, a big one, especially for our old structures that aren't detailed, are rarely detailed to our current design standards. So in general, a ductile system is better than a, a brittle system. And that's because ductile failures occur much slower than brittle failures. And they can sometimes provide evidence of structural distress prior to failure. Um, but, but when you think about shear failures, you need to be mindful that these are typically more sudden or more brittle failures than the ductile type that we see in bending failures. So to get a duct to be considered a ductile section, you need to have it this need to be designed in accordance with ACI code. And a lot of times we don't have those details um, on our structures that now is now called for in the codes. Um, this AS min, this row min and row max concept, uh, I've never seen one of our structures that exceed the row max. So usually you're looking at whether it meets that row min value of do you have the minimum amount of steel where you can count on for ductility. Um, shear strength based on exclusively on the shear strength of the concrete is okay, which is good because again, most of the structures I've been involved with don't have stirrups, don't have uh, steel to count for shear. But also keep in mind, just because it doesn't meet these requirements, it doesn't mean that your structure is going to fail or even fail in a brittle manner. So research has shown that these structures that we have are resilient and they can actually withstand displacements well beyond the yield the yield capacity and still be standing after the after the event. Um, just some more um, details for the reinforcement. Oftentimes our structures are not designed with the current codes. Hence that we know so much more about seismic detailing than what we knew um, you know, 40, 50 years ago. So those details have changed. And a lot of these things we are lacking on now is embedment length, the splice lengths, the hook details on the rebar. And these can result in sudden pullout failures. And these massive structures we look at are typically lightly or under reinforced and can be greatly overstressed during seismic events, and which is why we consider them a potential failure mode. Some of these structural system con considerations. So these type of structures will perform well in seismic events. And these are structures that dissipate energy through inelastic deformation ones that alter the dynamic properties, so you have a period shift within the structure, and ones that can mobilize additional strength elsewhere in the system, i.e. structures that are considered highly redundant. So a lot of the hydraulic structures are generally not highly redundant, and I guess I would caveat that to say they're not highly external, externally redundant, and now you have a, a cantilever wall, we typically look at a slice through that because it's the same, same wall all the way through, but some of the Finite element modeling has shown these structures that have two, maybe more mats of reinforcing steel in both directions, that when you overstress one small area, that, that load can redistribute to all that other steel. And so I would say some of our hydraulic structures are more, more internally redundant and something to consider when you're looking at failure and a risk analysis. So just because you get one area that yields, does that mean your wall has completely yielded? So, and that kind of goes along with the retaining walls have historically performed very well during earthquakes. However, we don't have those database of looking at those 10,000 year earthquake vents and even more remote that we consider for some of our structures. Kind of alluding to previously, when you have demand capacity ratios that are high, you need to look, make sure it's not just one one area that's high and you say the structure fails. You finite element modeling, you always get the stress concentrations where you have a change in geometry or if you have a, a hole in your structure for some reason, you gotta consider the whole structure and not just a local, a local hotspot. Um, displacement criteria is one we'll talk about a little more. That's when the reinforcement has yielded, but it didn't fail in shear that some research has shown that these structures can displace two to three times what the yield displacement is. 
and still be and still be standing. So when you're in a, a risk analysis and in, uh, in discussing these potential failure modes, some challenges that that do come up, and kind of saw a little bit of it during the exercise yesterday is the team needs to discuss the severe damage and whether it will result in exceeding the capacity and how much and how often and, and what is that event, what, what are you going to estimate that event probability based on the damage that you're seeing in the models. And the remaining strength of a damage section. So that's again goes into a, it's going to be a, a judgment call and a discussion that can oftentimes be a lengthy discussion on on whether the structure has failed, whether it's a point point six or point nine nine or or what those estimate ranges are, because there's a lot of a lot of judgment call in these. And again, even with the most sophisticated finite element model, there's still uncertainty in those models. So circling back to reinforcement details matters, you see these uh, this column failure on the left. You see this a lot after after earthquakes and when you don't have confining steels, so stirrups going around these columns, then the once the concrete cover's gone, those vertical, vertical reinforcing steel is unsupported, as all doesn't take much for an unbraced length for the rebar to buckle. The Shikan Dam failure, we'll see it several other times throughout the presentations. This was a spillway shoot wall. But you see these counterforded walls or these buttress retaining wall failed and likely in shear failure at the base. And when you zoom in, we don't have a whole lot of details on this case history, but zooming in, there's really no, you can't really see any steel at all, whether tension steel or stirrups or any kind of steel in this, in this counter fort, which is concerning. So static loads. Pretty self-explanatory, pretty familiar with that, hydrostatic and soil. Soil loads, just keep in mind these are sustained loads, and if hopefully no none of our structures are going to fail under these type of loads, but these static loads are sustained, so they would be constant on the structure, and it would be hard to stop the failure mechanism if they were to occur. Generally, you have to have a change in one of these conditions to, to start having an active active failure mode. This could come from if your concrete has alkali aggregate reaction and it's leading to corrosion of the reinforcing steel. I was thinking uh, for a retaining wall or a gravity type of structure, maybe you have some kind of change in uplift forces that could that could cause this failure mode to initiate. Now when we get into dynamic loads, we're talking about earthquakes and then also barge impact loads. Barge impacts are typically a very large force that hits from from the barge, and then it's smaller loads hitting the wall as it as it proceeds down down the wall. The sections may not crack through the member thickness, even though the tensile capacity is exceeded for short durations. Again, when we're talking about seismic events and short durations, you got to think about if that was that force long enough, sustained long enough to crack through the section. One of the key things too here is the, to keep in mind is that last bullet point that's bolded is that for post seismic or post barge impact, you still must consider the ability of the structure to carry the the loads that are there now. So after a seismic event completely cracked through, but you still have water, you still have water on the dam. Is it stable in that post seismic? After all that damage, is your structure still stable? Looking at a, a time history plot here, we'll go into a little more details on this. And again, it's briefly touched on during the exercise yesterday. But you're looking at a time history and you have basically these one or two peaks that go high. And when you're looking at a pseudo-static analysis where you're getting a peak ground acceleration or a peak horizontal acceleration, it's it's taking that one one peak value and you're running that analysis and in reality it's seen one time during the seismic event and only for a very brief moment of time so there's some judgment call of whether that's enough to do the enough damage to the structure so now we're going to get into some of those code considerations so you need to be be careful when you're analyzing the capacity of your structure and you're using current codes like ACI or AASHTO. Oftentimes, oftentimes our structures don't meet these new codes. However, it, just, it doesn't mean just because you don't meet these detailing requirements that your 
that your uh, probability of failure is high. Um, the st our structures tend to be pretty massive in concrete dams, and the concrete and mass contribute to stability. And also, you could be in a low seismic hazard as well. So it's not just it's not just the structure's bad and it's going to fail just because you don't meet the the current detailing requirements. Some of these things you look at is uh, lap splices, the confining reinforcement that we showed we showed in that column failure. Whether you have closed ties or stirrups and the proper anchorage of ties. I've, uh, I worked in North Reclamation doing a lot of seismic evaluations of pumping plants and power plants. And never, I don't think ever did I see the 135 degree hook. It was just notorious almost 100% of the time you saw the 90 degree hook, which does not confine that steel very well. So again, there's good, good documents out there to look at existing structures. ASE 31 is the seismic evaluation of existing buildings. ASE 41 is the seismic rehabilitation of existing buildings. And then you have the FEMA 356 document that can give some guidance on these older details that we see. And now to once again talk about load factors and strength reduction factors. Um, it was mentioned yesterday, and I'll, I'll keep harping on it, that when you're looking at a risk analysis and taking a structure to failure, you've got to strip out all the load factors. You've got to strip out all the strength reduction factors on the capacity of your members. Those should all be one in those equations that you're going into a risk analysis with. And sometimes the person doing the analysis may not be on the risk analysis team, may not fully understand what it's going to be used for. So you got to make sure that what you're given doesn't include those load factors. Oftentimes we're using existing analysis that have been done, you know, could have been done years ago, and you have those load factors that are included. So you got to make sure that those have been stripped out when you get into a risk analysis. Um, but some other things, so that, that kind of takes the structure to the maximum capacity that you could expect, but there are some things so that you're not being unconservative. You need to consider the condition of the concrete and the reinforcement. You may be in a very corrosive environment that's deteriorated the concrete. You may have this alkali aggregate reaction present at your dam or at your structure. Um, is there freeze thaw damage, evidence of corrosion? So those, these are some things that need to be considered along with the capacities that you've calculated. Okay, so for here's a typical inventory for a reinforced concrete structure. So you'll notice this is one, this doesn't include the full elevation, this doesn't include the loading, this is just the, the conditional failure probability. So as you can see, there's multiple paths to failure here. This, this tree gets pretty, pretty big at times. So it becomes pretty daunting, but there are ways based on your structure that you may be able to simplify this tree at times, but it's still a good walks through all the considerations for the for the risk analysis team. So not understand you can't read all those and not expect it to, but just kind of walk through the through the events starting from the left. That's the concrete tensile strength. And then you're looking at bending the the state of the reinforcement of the steel reinforcement. Has it yielded? Is it still elastic? And then you move into shear, the response to shear, which is highly dependent on the condition of your, of your structure. If it's cracked all the way through, if the rebar is yielded, that shear capacity is going to be much different than if you have an unyielded section. And then we look at this displacement criteria, which again, it shows the ability of these structures to bend without breaking. And then you also look at this kinematic instability, that after the load, is it still is it still standing? Has it toppled? Has it slid? What's the condition? So this event one looks at the tensile capacity of the concrete and has the has the has the moment induced on the structure has it exceeded the cracking moment of the concrete? Oftentimes, yes. And then we move on to the event number two. And this is the reinforcement response to bending. So this is where we're calculating the yield moment of the section. And that's following the typical typical uh, ACI. One thing to note there on the bottom equation is this is 125% overstress of the yield is where it's most likely that you'll get a plastic hinging. So that's where you get, again, a plastic hinge where you likely can result in a failure. So that gets us to a fragility curve that has been, been proposed in best practices Again, these can be altered 
by the team with justification. But you'll see that when your you're demand to capacity ratio is less than one, you're very unlikely to fail. And then for adequately reinforced, that second line over here, that, uh, that takes you to the 1.25. That comes from the ACI for overstressed, where you think you likely develop a plastic hinge. And then a lot of our structures aren't adequately detailed, so considered lightly reinforced. And that's where this fragility curve recommends at 1.1. A DCR 1.1 that you're looking at, it's very likely that this event will occur. And so a lot of times we put the time histories, you get a lot of data, but there's software out there. This is SP column in particular, where you can dump all those results into a, this is an axial load versus moment or PM diagram. And you can see how many of those stay within the capacity envelope and how many of those are exceeded. So you'll see, you know, the bottom one, you have many, many exceedances of the, of the capacity, and you're looking at a, a pretty high estimate for one of those. A response to shear, also a fragility curve, is provided in best practices as a starting point. Um, but we'll cover this a little more. I'm, I'm running short on time, but we'll cover this more in a seismic, one of the seismic potential failure modes. So it, for shear, for this is usually, you know, we use for concrete dams, just a typical sliding equation that can be used as this, especially for like when you have a crack section, you can apply this equation and then you can also account for shear friction reinforcement if it's available, if this steel hasn't completely yielded or ruptured, you can count on some portion of the of shear friction reinforcement. So again, you're trying to take these structures to the, to the capacity without, with stripping out the factors of safety. And there's some some charts, some some charts, some design guidance for response to shear as a function of the normal stress. And you'll see the one on the left is for when you have bonded lift lines, so you anticipate having cohesion. And then the one on the right is for unbonded, unbonded lift lines. And there there could be some apparent cohesion in those cases, but but pretty small. The displacement criteria that I referred to earlier, this is when you have your moment steel has yielded, but you did not fail in shear. And some research uh, by Metasozan considers the nonlinear behavior of these concrete structures, and it determines that they are, they are quite resilient. They can, dis they can displace quite a bit beyond that yield displacement before failing. Um, these are, this just goes through some calculations for that. It's pretty easy when you have a constant E in the elastic range. Um, you still may want to consider a crack section to change your moment of inertia. Um, and then to calculate the, the nonlinear displacement, that gets a little more difficult. Um, finite elements gives the, best, gives the best results, but there are some simplified approaches where you can reduce the modulus of elasticity by a half or to a third. Um, and then you keep in mind at that point with these displacement, you need to keep in mind the second order effects, P delta. And there are fragility curves provided for this as well to help the team estimate the likelihood of this event. And then we have the event five, that kinematic instability that you need to consider for these structures after, after yielding, after shear through, still checking to see if the structure is still there. So for the larger massive structures, you're looking at sliding. For the taller slender ones with this displacement, so it's got additional load on there, and you're looking at toppling for those cases. And again, all these post seismic, you need to consider the stability after the seismic event. So the takeaway points, we have a fail, uh, failure mechanisms for various types of concrete structures. They're generally well understood, but there's still a lot of uncertainty, especially under seismic loadings, and especially under the seismic loadings we apply to, to some of our structures. Uh, there's been a lot of, there's been several case studies of barge impacts and limited failures of flood walls or spillways have been documented that were a result of structural failures. And concrete and reinforced material properties, they're generally well understood, but I would say there's still uncertainty and oftentimes the in situ properties are, are not always known. The type and duration of the load is important and you need to consider structures, whether they're ductile failures or brittle failures. And the seismic detailing, like what we've gone on, gone over, it's changed dramatically and you need to be cautious when 
calculating the capacities based on ACI or AASHTO. All right, I think that's it and I'm out of time. All right, any questions? All right, thanks Adam.